If a World War II bomber is crash landing in hostile territory, the pilot will destroy the identification friend or foe or IFF system by pressing these two buttons. This will trigger an explosive charge in the plane's IFF transponder. The intent of this video is to deep dive review the function, characteristics, destruct features, and tactical deployment rules of a World War II aircraft-based IFF system. This chart from a 1993 Office of Technology Assessment document outlines the causes of fracticide during World War II, the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Misidentification of target accounts for 26% of occurrences. A critical factor during a battle or war is the ability to distinguish between friend or foe, as discussed in this 1945 U.S. Fleet Radar document. Due to various preventable reasons, friendly forces have lost their lives and enemy forces have escaped due to misidentification. Recognition is defined as identifying other contacts as a friend or foe. Identification is relaying yourself as a friendly. Radar systems will not provide sufficient data to categorize PIP scope indications as friendly or foe, as defined in this 1943 War Department document titled Instructions Concerning IFF Equipment. Aircraft identification is not possible at night or in poor visibility conditions. Several methods have been used for aircraft identification prior to the introduction of the IFF system, including coordination of radar returns with ground observers, coordination of radar returns with information centers planned flight routes, and through the process of elimination of possibilities. This is what occurred during the Pearl Harbor attack. The Oahu radar operators were told the Japanese attacking PIP radar indications was a group of B-17s. No U.S. IFF system was operational in 1941. No alert was sounded. Any unidentified flight can be met with defensive measures. A simplified description of the IFF system is listed on this page from a 1946 Tactical Use of Radar and Aircraft document. Radar provides the contact's range and bearing. Aircraft radar returns are listed as bogies until they can be classified as friendly or enemy, or skunks if it's a surface contact. The electronic IFF system will aid in identifying the contact as a friendly. This schematic provides a description of how the IFF system works from a 1944 War Department Technical Manual. The IFF system equipped aircraft is located here, the plane's IFF antenna. The ground IFF radar system is here. This image shows U.S. and German ground radar systems with their attached IFF antenna shaded. The ground system radar transmits a radar signal represented by these arrows, which progressively get thinner as the signal loses power traveling farther from the source. The radar signal is reflected off the aircraft and returns to the radar receiver at a much weaker signal. A return PIP is picked up by the radar display scope. While all of this is going on, the ground IFF interrogator transmitter is sending out a challenge signal from the ground station's IFF antenna. The signal also loses power as it travels farther from the source. The plane's IFF transponder receives the ground IFF challenge signal, and this will automatically trigger a preset coded response reply. This coded signal is picked up and evaluated for authenticity by the ground IFF responder receiver antenna. The signal is usually stronger than the radar return. Control unit's inner connector will relay the beep return to the radar scope. The display scope IFF return beep is superimposed on the radar return's PIP. This image shows a radar scope echo pulse PIP amplitude from radar alone and the pulse from an IFF equipped aircraft where the amplitude momentarily peaks every 6 seconds from the added IFF beep signal from a 1943 command informational intelligence series document titled This is Radar. This page from a 1944 Radar Operator's Information File document outlines IFF system components installed on an aircraft. The IFF control box is shaded here. This is usually located in the bomber's radio room. The IFF coding switch, which is preset prior to takeoff. The system's on-off switch. This emergency switch will trigger the system to send an IFF distress signal. The radio operator will plug in his headset and listen to make sure the system is functioning. The plane's IFF receiver transmitter is shaded here. Since the system is classified, the receiver transmitter is fitted with a detonator. The detonator is located here and will destroy the box's critical components and wires. The detonator will explode if the two buttons located in the safety box are pushed simultaneously. The detonator is also activated if the inertia switch's forward load factor threshold is exceeded. 
another view of the inertia detonator and the IFF antennas location on a B-29. The IFF control box is located in the radio operator station in the B-29 from a 1944 B-29 GenFan manual and mounted here in the B-17's radio compartment. This image is from Hangar13.org's website. The inertia detonator is located here. The location of the IFF control box in the Black Widow. IFF destructors push button safety box. Operation and features of the IFF control box are shown here in this image from a 1943 aircraft radio receiving equipment document. The control box is shaded here. Turn the control box power on. Select the plane's IFF code position to one specified by the mission. Each position will send a different responsive code when the plane is IFF challenge triggered for reply. Each channel will reply with a different four code combination signal as listed in this table. Position 1 replies with four narrow widths, whereas position 5 code is a narrow blank wide blank. The plane's transponder sends this code in a frequency range between 157 and 187 megacycles. Only use the emergency switch if the plane is in distress. At takeoff, insert the PL-177 plug into the top of the IFF receiver transmitter detonator. This image shows a PL-177 bonding plug and its location in the IFF receiver transmitter. The plug bridges the destructor detonator circuit if activated. Characteristics in an image of the M3 destructor are listed on this page from a 1944 demolition material document. It is 6 inches long and contains 2 grams of an explosive pellet. The PL-177 plug is attached here. Additional information of the B-29's IFF receiver transmitter detonator are listed on this page. The detonator can be activated by the pilot pushing the red safety boxes to spring-loaded buttons as shown here on the B-17. The buttons need to be pushed simultaneously to initiate the detonator. The detonator will also explode if the inertia switch experiences a longitudinal 10 to 13 G load factor. The B-29's IFF antenna position is located here from a February 1945 AAF B-29 radio project document. The B-17's IFF antenna and the PBY's IFF antenna from a 1945 Naval Aviation Bulletin document. The B-29's IFF check test results are listed on this page. The IFF signal response ranges are roughly line of sight. At an altitude of 6,000 feet, the B-29's IFF system was picked up at a distance of 85 miles. The line of sight ranges can be determined on this chart. The x-axis is the distance from 1 to 200 nautical miles. The y-axis is the log altitude of the aircraft from 5 to 30,000 feet. The lines in the body of the chart are the optical line of sight distance or radar distance. The line of sight chart predicts a 74 nautical mile visual line of sight distance from an altitude of 6,000 feet, which equates to 85 miles. This 1946 chart matches expectations of a spherical Earth with a diameter around 7,917 miles. This page outlines IFF usage rules from a September 1943 instructions on IFF document. The areas around Great Britain were distributed into zones as shown on this map. Area A, a bomber's IFF system shall be on day or night from takeoff until landing. Area B, the IFF system shall be on from takeoff until 50 miles past the coastline, then turned off. The system shall be turned on when within 100 miles of the coastline to touchdown on a return flight back to base. Area C, same as Area B, except the system shall be turned off when 10 miles past the UK coastline on outboard flights and back on when leaving the enemy coastline on a return flight back to base. The system will be turned on if within visual range of an Allied warship. Bombers will use transponder code number 1. Ships or planes tracking access ships code 4. Fighters code 6. Always approach the UK coastline at or above 2,000 feet in altitude. It is advisable to turn on the plane's IFF system when within range of Allied radar systems, land or sea, as discussed in this April 1943 radar identification document. When flying over enemy territory, it is recommended to turn off the plane's IFF system. Enemy radar may trigger the plane's response, which would provide the enemy information on the type of plane. Best to keep the IFF off if flying over enemy airspace. 
pilots were lax about following IFF usage guidelines as discussed on this page from a 1983 Army Air Forces in World War II Volume 6 document. One test showed 80% of pilots did not have their sets on when operating procedures indicated otherwise. A World War II study of the IFF system showed that out of 100 non-IFF radar contacts, 66% were from pilot error, 30% equipment error, and 4% ground equipment or operator error. Air crew errors included planes IFF not turned on, turned on at the wrong time or location, IFF turned on at incorrect distances from the coastline, wrong IFF channel. Since not turning on the system at takeoff was the largest error, a ground personnel with a large sign reading IFF on reduced bogey contacts by 10 to 25%. Additional system maintenance reduced IFF equipment errors down to 3%. If you've enjoyed and found this World War II IFF deep dive usage video informative, please consider supporting the channel by liking, commenting, and or subscribing to World War II U.S. Bombers.